Hey everybody, welcome to our live stream. And don't forget, if you share the newscast today, you'll be entered in to win one of our NEA Report t-shirts. We gave one away here today. In fact, we've got a winner to announce right now. Today's winner, before we begin the show, is... Michelle Rapert McGinnis. Congratulations, Michelle. We're going to be in touch and let you know just exactly what you'll need to do to win. It's not going to take much, though. All you've got to do is hang around and watch NEA Report, and you might be a winner, too. Just click Share, and you'll have an opportunity to win. Stand by, folks. We've got breaking news to start the show out in just a moment. It's 4 o'clock in Jonesboro, and we're watching stories this hour, including the closing of Express in the Mall at Turtle Creek. Even though that store may be closing, there's another store that's going to be opening, or at least a restaurant that's going to be opening, not very far away. Slim Chickens adding another location in Jonesboro. We're talking about that on the way. Plus, Walnut Ridge is looking at increasing their sales tax, but it may come at the reduction of another bill. Details on that. Plus, feral hogs. What else needs to be said except for that to get you to watch? And we're talking to George Jarrett. Our buddy's going to come in and talk to us about a cold case uh, of a young lady who was murdered in Arkansas and lots more. It's going to be a great discussion, as always, with George. And all of that is next on NEA Report. So let's get to it. Reporting. Welcome to NEA Report, where we begin with breaking news tonight as we're live with the news here at 4 on Facebook. The breaking news this evening to begin the show with is that the Express Clothing Store in the mall at Turtle Creek, the one in the food court there right in the center, is going to be closing. We found the news out earlier today and broke it exclusively first on NEAReport.com. Let's talk about that right now as well. A store employee confirmed it to us this afternoon that the store located in the mall will be closing on January 27th. The store employee said that the corporate office had determined that the store was not profitable enough to remain open, and the employee even mentioned that he felt the company may not have been able to work out a rent agreement with the property owners there at the mall in Turtle Creek. He said that the store will be closing on January 27th, but a sale was already underway at the store, with a major discount already available for some. However, store staff said that's not a liquidation sale that's going on there. It just so happened that a regular sale event that all the stores are doing, probably post-holiday sales, was happening coinciding with the looming closure of the store. Staff members are already searching for other jobs, the employee told NEA Report, as they're expecting on January 27th to end their employment with Express. Jonesboro is seeing a lot of new business that's coming in, and in fact, this week we've already seen some business stories that have come about, and we have another one for you to bring to you right now. Slim Chickens is going to be opening another establishment in town, and it's coming soon. In fact, the Arkansas-based restaurant is expanding into Jonesboro's market with a second restaurant, and it was announced today by Haig Brown Commercial. In fact, we found out that it's going to go into the Highlands Shopping Center's first out pad. Uh, so some neat news there. In fact, a quote from Josh Brown said that they've been involved with Slim Chickens for a long time. In fact, he said he used to regularly eat at the one of the original locations in Conway. He said it was the first restaurant he ever tried to bring to Jonesboro. Uh, neat thing about it is that we now have a couple of Slim Chickens in town, right? Like we've got uh, one over there on Stadium, and then we've got now this one that's going to be on the way too. Uh, with easy access from both Red Wolf Boulevard and Highland Drive, additional seating, an outdoor patio, and more suitable drive through for some, this new store is going to allow us to better serve our customers. That's a quote from the Slim Chickens managing partner, Howard Martindale. 
Uh, the Highland Shopping Center sits on seven acres at the intersection of Highland Drive and Red Wolf Boulevard and really been a landmark uh, in Jonesboro's retail market for a long time. But over the past several months, it's just totally changed. The place looks incredible now. It looks like it's, it's from the future. I love it. Zach Qualls of Hague Brown Commercial manages the property for GMP Development. And he's overseen the redevelopment. He called it a pleasure working with GNP Development on rebranding one of the most well-known shopping centers in Jonesboro. He said this group has done an amazing job of securing quality tenants like, well, like the new Slim Chickens. As mentioned, it will set at the center of the Highland Drive entrance uh, there at the shopping plaza. This is going to be setting just east of U.S. Pizza. Two buildings were torn down in order to make room for the 2,400 square foot freestanding building. It's going to kind of stand by itself. You can see the uh, conceptual drawing there on the screen. And uh, other restaurants there include U.S. Pizza, Fuji, TJ Burgers, and they're all performing extremely well, Hague Brown says. Construction will begin soon, and you can expect to see another Slim Chickens in town by the fall of this year. Northeast Arkansas is definitely Red Wolf country, right? But we may be a fan of the hogs here, too, but not a fan of a certain type of hog, and we're talking about feral hogs. In fact, a lot of people don't even realize this, but did you know that Arkansas actually has a task force devoted to eradicating their existence completely? No doubt, that's true. Arkansas aims to drive feral hogs to extinction, and it's, it's literally what an Arkansas task force is called, the Arkansas Feral Hog Eradication Task Force. It falls under the purview of the Arkansas Agriculture Department, and it was created by the Arkansas legislature during 2017, the 2017 session. Of course, while a lot of us like hogs in the state, feral hogs are a different type of beast entirely. Feral hogs are a little more than pests, the Agri Department says. They're not native to the United States, certainly not to Arkansas. They're an invasive species that really sort of began as people were letting hogs loose for hunting or maybe hogs that were in captivity got loose and then over the years they bred and bred and spread and these animals are ridiculously intelligent. In fact, to the point where shooting hogs uh, will maybe teach some of them, the ones that you don't hit or the ones that miss, that they should avoid humans and it increases their survivability. They have big brains for their, uh, well, their nature at least. According to the U of A Division of Agriculture Extension Office, although small herds of feral hogs have lived in Arkansas for generations, the hog population increased dramatically in the feral sense and since the 1990s. Controlling this prolific feral hog has proven difficult because they are very adaptive and they avoid hunters and traps and they learn too. Plus, the reason they're so bad, that's a different measure entirely, it's a different matter, where they compete for food resources, they'll destroy a habitat by rooting and wallowing around, they'll eat ground nesting birds and eggs and fawns, young domestic livestock even. Uh, and they carry diseases like bacteria, parasites, they even have some form of swine herpes. The feral beasts are growing in Arkansas and a growing problem, and few, if any, natural predators are taking care of them. So that's why Arkansas has formed this task force to help eradicate the pest that causes, uh, costs uh, Arkansans and other Americans $1.5 billion annually by damaging cross, uh, crops, injuring livestock, transmitting diseases, destroying the ecology of an area. I mean, just all different types of trouble. They contaminate human food and water supplies as well. So in Arkansas, it's legal to shoot feral hogs on privately owned land, day or night, any time. That's what the resources we were looking up today told us. Capturing a feral hog, as some realize that they have to do due to trapping, well, that's also allowed, but you have to immediately kill the creature unless you're deciding to keep it on the land that it was captured on only, and it has to be privately owned land that it was captured on there, too. If you want to find out more information about how to go hog killing, well, go to NEAReport.com first. In your new Wave Wireless forecast, the five-day forecast, 
we're looking at a day of temperatures that are going to go from 63 degrees down below freezing all in the same day. And I, I mean, I don't know if that's a record or some kind, but that's an incredible disparity, an over 30 degree drop in one single day. Let's take a look at it right now and show you what it looks like. Home of the $49 iPhone screen repair, that's New Wave Wireless. And then tonight, let's look at what it looks like for us in Northeast Arkansas. Occasional drizzle and a chance of fog. Uh, a chance of rain, I should say, with areas of fog. Really, they're guaranteed. Cloudy skies otherwise in a high, sorry, a low down to 43. We're going to see really light winds, but that's going to change tomorrow. A 30% chance for showers with cloudy skies in the high up to 59. It's going to feel like fall or maybe even a cooler day in the summer tomorrow. But south winds 5 to 15 miles per hour. Then Wednesday night, a 50% chance for showers with cloudy skies and the low, and I'm not I'm not making a mistake here. The low is down to 55 degrees. How is that a low for this time of the year? On Thursday, showers are likely with cloudy skies and a high near 63. South winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. Chance of rain 70%. Could see up to half an inch of rainfall on Thursday. This is where it starts to get really weird, though. Thursday night, rain showers before 3 a.m. Quite clearly, that's early Friday morning, but they call it Thursday night at the Weather Service. After 3 a.m. Friday morning, snow, a low around 29, winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. Now, good grief, those winds have got to go down a little bit, uh, and and but they're still they're still lasting throughout the next few days. You would think with that cold air it would calm it down, but no. Um, again, Thursday night. Chance of precipitation 100%. New snow accumulation less than half an inch possible. So we're going to see snow Thursday night. That's pretty cool. That's what's up. On Friday, a chance for snow before noon, then a chance for rain, with mostly cloudy skies and a high near 34. Look at the day before. The high near almost 64, and the next day the high near 34. That's crazy. Uh, again, north winds 15 miles per hour. Chance of precipitation 50%. If you ask me, and I'm not one to predict the future, no weather person is, and I'm not even a qualified meteorologist. I'm just a guy that's reading the weather. Uh, but nonetheless, I don't think you're going to see. I think you could end up seeing a couple of schools call in and say, eh, we're not going to do that thing on Friday. We'll have to see. But if between 3 a.m. and, uh, well, school time, you see half an inch of snowfall, but it's saying less than half an inch possible. So again, we'll keep a watch on that. That's going to be one of those weird situations Thursday night into early Friday. Uh, but Friday night, a chance of rain and snow before midnight, then a chance of snow, mostly cloudy skies, a low of 25, and the chance for precipitation, whatever kind it may be, 50%. So you've got that out there. By Saturday, partly sunny, the high near 32, freezing. You're kidding me. More of those cold temperatures are back, but the snowfall does look to be gone. Uh, at least through Sunday and into Martin Luther King Day as well. The city of Walnut Ridge is going to be exploring the opportunity for raising their sales tax, but it would come at the lowering of another cost of residents there in the community. Here's what we're talking about. It's actually on the agenda for this month's Walnut Ridge City Council meeting, and it discusses, uh, discusses two different possible sales tax raises, which would both equal together to be a 1% raise. It's basically one sales tax raise proposal, but they divide it up so that it can uh, be accounted for where the funding would be going. Three-eighths of that 1% sales tax would go for sewer upgrades, the ones that are mandated right now. They are they're absolutely needed. In fact, we'll talk to Mayor Charles Snap about that in a second. Five-eighths of it would go for the other two things that we've got listed there, and we're going to break those down into percentages as well. Should get pretty complicated before we're done. 20% um, would go towards reserve funding, and then 80% for sanitation costs. Reserve funding meaning sewer upgrade reserve funding, uh, the sewer system in Walnut Ridge there really a, a lot of issues that, that they've had with it um, and they are hoping now to get that upgraded but um, it's not a normal sales tax request because they've been mandated to do this they have to do this and the alternative is to tack on a increase on folks sanitation bill but what makes this tax increase a little bit different from most requested tax increases is that it's coming at the potential offsetting of cost that would come elsewhere, such as on the sanitation well, that's, bill. Well, uh, that's true, Stan. And uh, actually, the whole concept's a little bit different than a lot of people would do. From the standpoint, first of all, we're 
mandated by the Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality to do uh, significant upgrades to the uh, wastewater treatment plant right now. And uh, this has been ongoing since 1994 when this plant went online. And the anticipated upgrades are going to cost in the neighborhood of $5 million is what's anticipated. So we're going to have to do a bond issue uh, to pay for these upgrades. And to pay off the bonds, we have a, have a choice. As a city, we charge the residents probably an additional $10 a month on their water and sewer bill over what they're already paying. Or we give them a chance to vote on a sales tax. Actually, it would be two different sales tax issues. And instead of having to add $10 a month to the bill, if both issues passed, it could reduce their current bill by $13.50 a month and avoid that increase. So in essence, instead of having additional charges put on them, they would be saving an average of $162 per household per year if these sales tax issues pass. The three-eighths percent uh, election is uh, listed under the agenda for the council meeting as being for the sewer upgrade committee and the remaining amount. Uh, part of that would go towards water and sewer departments to set up a reserve fund and then the rest would be used for the sanitation department. Does that sound right? The first three-eighths percent would pay the bonds off for the five million, up to five million in uh, repairs mm -hmm. and upgrades. Okay. The next five-eighths of a percent, which the two together equal a penny on the dollar, mm -hmm. the second five, the second uh, offering, if the five-eighths passes, 20% of that would be used to set up that accelerated depreciation fund to keep the water and sewer systems going to where 40 years from now, residents aren't facing the problem that we've been plagued with ever since this system went online that we're using now in 1994. This is uh, Walnut Ridge trying not to kick the can down the road, basically. Right. It's time we take responsibility as administration. And when we have an idea to make changes, you know they're not going to last 30 and 40 years. The one we have hasn't lasted 25. But there was no mechanism in place to keep this system up and rebuild it time and time again. It's like buying a car, Stan. You buy a car and you start out and it's under warranty and you very seldom have to take it in for anything. But you get 10, 15 years on that car and you've got a lot of replacement parts and some of those things wear out quicker than others. But uh, eventually, you're going to have to keep rebuilding that car to keep it on the road. And that's what we're trying to do is establish a fund that residents on down the line don't worry. The, we're giving the folks an opportunity to benefit themselves, but their kids and their grandkids for generations to come. And at the same time, we can lower the cost of living to the, the residents of Walnut Ridge. When, if this is approved, do you know uh, when the plan is for the vote to be? Uh, right now, we're specifically going to request these be passed using an emergency clause because uh, we want to give the people a chance to vote on it in the March 22nd primary election. Okay. Uh, sales tax elections are considered special elections, and they'll qualify for other time slots. But the sewer committee, and I agree with them entirely, recommend, are recommending the primary election in May because more people will vote during that election. So you get a more realistic sampling of what the residents want. We're here to represent those people, and this administration as a whole understands these repairs have to be done. We have two choices, add to the water and sewer bill, or pass a sales tax, which will enable us to take some off the water and sewer bill.
Family Medical Clinic of Walnut Ridge and Bono are your neighborhood health care providers, and we're now accepting new patients. We know you have a tight schedule, so we're here six days a week at both locations from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Walk-ins are welcome. In Walnut Ridge, stop by 1045 West Main Street or call us to make an appointment, 886-8300. In Bono, we're on Highway 63 North or call 930-9990. Walnut Ridge Family Medical Clinic and Bono Family Medical Clinic. Here for you when you need us. We had a website that we had had for a number of years. It had become unwieldy to navigate. Ace One said, give me a little time and I'll come up with something and just see what you think about it. It blew us away. Ace One and his staff have given such close personal attention and outstanding customer service just as if we were a million dollar company. I just can't say enough good things about them. Thanks for joining us today. We are back during our favorite time of the week. It's that time of the week where we sit down with my good buddy George Jarrett and somehow or another we make news out of just me and you hanging out. Absolutely. We appreciate you coming in. Uh, thanks a bunch. Mm -hmm. So as we're sitting here talking, I wanted us to start about uh, a local story and we're going to get to that here in just a second. We're sitting here talking and as we're communicating we get the, uh, a news alert popped up about Steve Bannon stepping down from Breitbart. So we're going to talk about that in a second, okay? Um, but first of all, you've told me that for your next book, you're working on a uh, story, actually working on a cold case that's got uh, major connections here in northeast Arkansas in relation to Amanda Tussing. Can you tell us more about that and what you're working on? Sure. Um, Amanda Tussing was a 20-year-old um, who lived um, here in northeast Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, in June of 2000, she, um, she left her fiancé's um, house here in Jonesboro, and she was going back to her parents' house in Blyville, and um, she was on Highway 18, and she just vanished. Um, nobody knows exactly. It was, it was late night. It was around midnight. Um, and I'm in the process of getting all these details put together Still now. Still doing it, yeah. And um, so um, anyway, they found her car, and then a few days later, they found her body kind of like in a drainage ditch or something like that. And um, to this day, it's been an unsolved murder. And the interesting part about it is, is there's been a lot of speculation for years that it was a serial killer cop who might what? have done it. Yes. Or a, po or a police officer, somebody in law enforcement. And there's also been rumors that it may have been like a, like a terrible drug deal, like some oh. gone wrong. Yeah. Um, so there's been all this speculation, and no one has ever been able to determine um, exactly what happened to her. Um, it, it's a story that's always kind of fascinated me, and so... Um, you know, it's one of the most notorious unsolved cases in this part of the state, and a lot of people are familiar with Amanda Tessing. I've talked to a lot of people who knew her, who went to school with her. Um, I've been contacted by her relatives before they've asked me to write about it, mm -hmm. and so I'm going to start um, next week. I'm going to start sitting down with some detectives and stuff like that, and, and getting kind of some mining out some of the fine details. It's pretty much cold case now. I right. Mean, it's been 18 years almost. It's been a while. And um, so I'm going to start on that. It's just one of uh, my next book project, so. Um, but I think it's interesting you mentioned that about uh, potentially uh, having a law enforcement uh, involved in it. Makes me think to Drew Peterson. Uh, yes. And, and you know, you, every, for those who don't know, the cop that, that he kept have every wife he had ended up disappearing. Somehow, like, some way. Yeah, every one of them, like five yeah. or something, four yeah. or five. And then, in fact, it was so wild, he was being uh, questioned on air by Shepard Smith one day. Yes. Um, you remember that interview? Yes, yeah, yes. But anyway, um, that's, you hate to say it, but that's that's somebody that could get by with it and hide it the, pretty the easily. The thing about it is, and I, I remind people, because I've talked about this case a little bit, like even just at my gym and other places, mm -hmm. and um, a, lot of, a lot of people would be like, you know, you're told now, if, even if you're being stopped by what you believe is a police officer at night, you would drive to a well-lit area, you yeah. have a cell phone. But if you go back, you know, almost 20 years ago, a lot of people didn't have cell phones, especially a rural route like that between here and Blyville. Yeah. And some rural spots, there would be no cell service anyway. And there were some details of the crime, and I'm going to get into those details with the detective next week, um, that made them believe that it could possibly be a police officer or somebody impersonating a police officer. Now, the thing about it is, is it didn't happen again, so it's... 
you know, just from a logic standpoint, it would probably be more likely that it was. And I believe that a police officer was even questioned in the case. Oh, wow. And so we're going to get it. I'm going to try to get in and dig into those details and see what we can find out. You could be dealing with the kind of situation where somebody's instincts to, to look into the office uh, officer may have been correct. I mean, yes. we don't know. That's a speculation. But yes. Uh, that's that's very interesting. Well, I hope that you're able to find out more about that. Yes. Um, obviously, you know that could bring a lot of closure. Uh, there's so many unsolved cases. It's just hard to imagine how many go unsolved. There are there are several. And, yes. And they fall off the radar so easily. Mm -hmm. I mean, what people don't realize is JPD is just one example. One law enforcement agency, they have three or four pages every day of a list of all the reports that they took. And so mm -hmm. if you have every single day that many, I mean, you can't keep up with them all. Nobody could. Mr. It's Data, impossible. You know, couldn't. So yeah, it's impossible. It really is. So um, so shift gears for a second here, okay? Uh, I want to talk to you about, uh, you had mentioned when you came in, you told me that you were actually working on a, a sort of remembrance piece in relation to a name around here that's mm -hmm. contributed one of Arkansas's most well-known brands, mm -hmm. uh, the Yarnell's Ice Cream brand, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, personally, you can take one look at me and tell. <laughs> um, and so uh, tell me a little bit about um, the history of uh, Albert Yarnell, you told me. Albert Yarnell, he was 94 years old. He passed away Sunday night. Um, his his father actually founded the Yarnell Ice Cream Company back in the early 1930s in Searcy. Um, Searcy, Arkansas. Searcy, Arkansas. That's so cool. And Albert was the own, their only child, and what he did is he, um, he, would, he started off working for his dad when he was 12. He would actually get on a bicycle and deliver ice cream what? to help, like, they had truck routes. Yeah. But if they got slowed down or needed help, he would actually jump on his bike and just haul it and get ice cream to wherever they were going. Because yeah, people be loving that blueberry cobbler. That, that's right, that's know, right. Or blackberry cobbler. So. Right. I, so, and they were the only ice cream company in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And then in, and during the, uh, in the 1940s, he obviously served in World War II. He was of that age. And then when he came back, he became the vice president of the company. Um, and uh, he, he became the sales manager. And it expanded, you know, became one of the, uh, you know, uh, one of the, preeminent businesses in Arkansas. I love it. Arkansas was known for Yarnell's ice cream. Mm -hmm. And um, he, uh, uh, he, he was elected into the Arkansas Business Hall of Fame. Um, and he was just an, a, a pillar of his own. Uh, just to tell you how well thought of he was at Searcy, mm -hmm. there came a time when the mayor of Searcy was, was elected to this uh, House of Representatives in the Arkansas legislature. Mm -hmm. And they needed to appoint an interim mayor, and they just appointed him because they just he would just be the guy. You wow. know, everybody just said, "Hey, this is the person we would appoint." Yeah. And uh, he he was very charitable, um, very well liked guy, and he obviously lived to a very very old age and claimed that he ate ice cream every single day. I so, believe it. So you know what? If you're eating a Yarnell's ice cream, you know you're you may be all right, Stan. And if you take one look at me, I'm on track to live to be 150 <laughs> right now. Um, but no, it sounds like a life well lived, and and you know I, I'm looking forward to reading about that. I want to hear more. Um, the Yarnell's brand, very interesting. I followed it for many years and yes. had a little trouble the last, I think during the Great Recession is when uh, they did. it got hit pretty hard. They shut down actually in June of 2011, mm -hmm. um, but then they were bought by a, a Chicago-based company in November of that year, and they relaunched as Yarnell's <clears throat> in 2012. And their marketing, if you their social media marketing, as I hit the wrong button there, uh, is uh, incredible. Second to none. They get on social yes. media and they talk, you know, and, and plus their brands. I think they have Woo Pig Suey. Yeah. And that was his favorite. Was it his favorite? Yes. So that's a perfect transition point for us to talk about the last thing I want to hit on here today. I want to talk to you about feral hogs. Uh, uh, not the kind of pigs uh, that we're talking about with the right. Arkansas Razorbacks, more uh, or less, the much less popular. Uh, but, but I never knew this was an issue. It, it, it's, becoming, it's become a big issue in recent years. Um, I talked to the uh, Agriculture Secretary, Wes Ward, today, mm -hmm. and him and I talked about it a little bit. And feral hogs, are basically, they don't even know how many there are, mm. but they know the damage that they're causing, like in row crop fields and like levees. They're really notorious to dig into levees and cause major damage. And so just empirically, they're, they're, they're noticing a big change. And they believe that there are feral hogs in all 75 counties in Arkansas now. That's incredible. Yeah. And yeah. so they've appointed a task force. You know, they've thought about, you know, there, there's a myriad of options. They could try to, you know, they could have a hunt. You know, people could sure. just have a specialized hunt where you get you send people out. Um, they could set traps, which would be really expensive and hard to do. 
Um, another thing they could do is um, they could poison them, which there are some types of poisons that USDA has uh, approved. Got to be careful with that because then you kill somebody, k kills one of them, goes and has a barbecue. Right. You know. Or you, you, or you could, uh, the unintended consequence, you could kill other animals True. that you're not, you're not aiming to kill. Right. So there's a lot of issues. But, yeah, feral hogs, is, it, it's actually turning into a really big agriculture issue in the state of Arkansas. I could not believe, I did a little research earlier today, could not believe how much damage just, just a couple can cause to a whole field. Oh, yeah. It, it's just like that they, they've got little plows attached to them or something. I mean, they literally, literally, that's exactly what they are. It's really what they are, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and they love to root. I mean, that's yeah. what they do. And they're going to root in those fields, and they're going to destroy those crops. I mean, that's just it's a real problem it's almost you know like um for years here in northeast arkansas you know like coyotes you mm -hmm. know yeah yeah big, big problem on a lot of you know farmland and you know so a lot of times you know farmers are out there with on atvs you know trying to get rid of all these coyotes my uncle yeah. right 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 <laughs> I, I know several i wasn't gonna name any names but yep. um but uh yeah that it's it's a real problem and it's something that we're gonna have to deal with i think that it's going to be interesting to see where that goes i think the, the task force being formed for it uh is, is going to be interesting to follow as well so last thing i did i said that was going to be the last thing and then 14 more news alerts popped up on my phone about steve bannon um you've been following fire and fury i i, I know you're so busy you probably haven't had a chance to dive into it uh deeply just yet but um is anybody denying any of the stories out of this? Not really, no. That's shocking uh, to Tony me. Tony Blair has denied this account that he had, that he met with Jared Kushner and that they discussed um, the British government possibly, um, you know, surveilling the Trumps. Right. Um, he's he, denied he, that, but he, uh, as we talked about earlier, it's kind of something that he would you would expect him to deny. Almost have to. Almost have to. Uh, Steve Bannon has not denied that he said the things that he said. He just stepped down. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we just got word uh, as of right now, he's done with Breitbart. He stepped down, which not a surprise because no surprise. The, the money behind Breitbart, the Mercer family, they yes. were done with him yes. over this one. Maybe a little bit before this, it seems like, yes. um, that that had happened. But Bannon was really, as the, the book paints, and later this week, I, here I am, I'm setting myself up on air to promise it, so now I'm going to have to do it. Uh, later this week, we're going to do a special on Fire and Fury because I've almost finished it completely, and I have I have spent incredible time analyzing this book. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating, mainly because it's written by a journalist who was next to the president for the first 100 days and then a considerable amount of time more. It is literally unbelievable that a journalist would have this kind of access where they, he was sitting in the West Wing talking to every single person who came in and out of those offices. And listening to the meetings. When they doors, the doors weren't closed to the Oval Office, which rarely happened, he could hear the entire meetings going on. Right. You know? And, um, you, know, you know, I've heard some people say that this is kind of written like a, like a Hollywood thriller, you know, type book, which I'm sure he probably has taken some liberties as a writer. But as far as the accuracy of what are in the pages, um, there have not been very many strong, there are no strong denials denying that any of this is true. No. So, and if these things are true that are in the book, very disturbing. Uh, 25th Amendment time. Uh, it, it's yeah, very concerning. I will say that the stuff that's in the book, it doesn't make any bones about it that, that uh, uh, he may be in a dangerous mental state. And, you know, that's according to the book. And there will be people that, that vehemently decide that this book is not true, and we respect that. Um, right. I, I didn't do any of the reporting, and obviously neither did you. But, mm -hmm. but just based on the book, based on a journalist that's there, um, you have to take a look at it. And I think it's important to at least consider it. And so um, the news about Bannon today, very interesting, because, of course, Steve Bannon, uh, his biggest clash, for those of you who don't know, and we'll talk about this more when we do analyze the book, he clashed with Jared and Ivanka. Those were his two biggest enemies mm -hmm. in the White House. You're not going to beat the Trump family when it comes to Donald Trump. You can't because they're his kids. Especially when it comes to Ivanka. Especially. He, he, has, a very, he has a very strong relationship with her. Probably, yes. it's, it seems just from an outside perspective that he has a stronger relationship even with her than maybe even with his sons. Mm, absolutely um, he does. And, and in fact, the book paints her as operationally so, not being disparaging, uh, functioning as the first lady more right. uh, than the First Lady does. Right. The book also says Melania didn't want him to win the election. And, I, and that hasn't been reported <clears throat> in other places before, yeah. um, that she was not she was not thrilled. But um, look at Trump the night he won on the White... When, when he won, he looked like a ghost. Like, he did not look like a winner right. to me. He looked like, oh gosh, well, now what am I going to have to well, do? Well, there's also been a lot of reporting out there, too, that even his his internal people told him 
that he was going to lose that election the day of the election. Yes, they did. And there was a lot to this, and according to the book, and and that's been reported in other places as well that yes. that he was advised, look, you're going to lose tonight. You're going to lose, you know, 350 electoral votes, something yeah. to that effect. So. He honestly may have been surprised. But, you know, he the, the book says that he was planning to launch a new cable news channel right. with Roger Ailes, right. Peter Thiel, Sean Hannity, who was going to leave Fox News, and Bill O'Reilly, who had just gotten fired from Fox News, right. of course, this year, but at that time he had not been still. They were going to form a new cable news channel, and this is the point in the book that I am at right now before I had to come to work. Uh, uh, Roger Ailes, two days before he was going to meet with the financier for this, slipped uh, in the bathroom, hit his head, and died a week later. Right. I mean, it, it, you may have had a second Fox News by, by this time or they were, on the way. I think, and, I, and I, I speculated about this last year, even before the election was done, mm -hmm. that if, if Donald Trump didn't win, um, just they had filed, you know, like paperwork with the FCC. Yes. And all these other things. And these were like small stories that came out, like Jared Kushner had filed. And it's kind of right. like the, you're setting the groundwork up. And I, I told people, even in September of last year, I said, I'm telling you what's going to happen now. Because he, he one thing, I know, you know, being in the news business, yep. I noticed, and I'm sure you noticed this too, he was just as quick to attack Fox News and Republicans as he was Democrats. He was. He spent as much time attacking them. And so when I'm watching this, I'm sitting, uh, you know, you, as an observer, you go, okay, so he's attacking Fox News. He's a businessman. And there's obviously a gigantic market for this type of news and for this type of business model. Certainly. And he was in a prime position to, oh, to take to become the biggest force in that market and push them out. And then you look at how Fox, at the initial outset of the debates, was pretty challenging towards Donald Trump. They, Fox News was. Megyn Kelly went out guns blazing. She did. And that, well, look what happened with that. Yeah, you know? I mean, they were, you know, they were really one of the last, like, I guess you would consider conservative media to, you know, Breitbart and all these other groups. They cut, they got on the Trump Train went the Trump train pretty the Trump quick. Train. <laughs> right, right. You better get that right, or you'll have fifteen trolls coming at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Trump train pretty quick, but they were very reticent to do it. Yes, I know. And um, I, I think, you know, they, they were, they weren't sure which way the wind was blowing. They right. didn't know it. They didn't know if the complete Republican base, because there was a hardcore part of the base that really, really liked him. But there was kind of like the business class Republicans who. Yeah. Took a long time. Ryan's you know, Priebus, Paul the, Ryan, the John McCain's, the Jeff Flakes, those kind of guys. It took them a long time, of course, and it seems like they've sort of you know backed away and then come back. Well, then and you had every time that that it would seem like everything was okay, like the Billy Bush tape come out, right? And then when Billy Bush come out, that you know Paul Ryan was suddenly thought he should drop out of the race, and right. Then, and that's that's why I mean you're talking about a lot of internal politics going on where really it, it it's in wonder that Trump lasted through the primary, but then that the GOP didn't end up completely on his bad side. Right. He he was so unconventional, and uh, the problem was is that it looked like the other Republicans in that primary, mm. they were bringing water balloons to a nuclear weapons fight. That's what I it mean, seemed like. I mean, they were still trying to be like typical, atypical politicians, where he wasn't going to be that. And here's the thing. Uh, you know, uh, like it, you know, like Trump's going to have his fake news awards in like a oh, week. Yeah, yeah. And that S sounds so asinine to yeah. most people but the thing about it is it makes me laugh i talk about it i think about it. I'm like he's going to give out to he said he's going to give out awards to the biggest losers in the news media yes. and it's funny it's funny it's absolutely absurd because credibility wise i don't think there's somebody with less credibility operating in a, a political position and yet uh, i want to see what he's going to give the award out oh to. yeah no you know, i mean I everybody's gonna, everybody's going to want to know and watch it sure and so he does these zany things that you would never expect like a guy in his position to do and i'll, I'll say this a lot of his supporters really don't like it when he does stuff like yeah. this they really hate that yeah you know they the the, the tweeting stuff yeah. i mean if you ask any trump supporter if the first thing if you and i've interviewed several of them I'll say, okay, they so... They hate his Twitter account. They hate it. They, yeah. they say this is what's bringing him down. They don't think it's his policies or these fights that he gets in with every you know body in Washington, mm. D.C. or wherever. It's a Twitter account. But what people, I think those people fail to realize is that, according to the book at least, that Twitter account is only a glimpse of how he actually is. He's having those outbursts all day long. And his staff's having a hard time controlling them. At least right. that's what the book says. So. And that's been, and again, the reports like this, 
have been around for months. They even, have even before the book came out, they, they said they were having these problems. And I always remind people, you know, news organizations are companies. Sure. And you think CNN hasn't made a lot of money off of Donald Trump? They've made a ton. They've made a ton. So whenever people talk about, like, you know, CNN being, like, fake news or whatever, mm -hmm. they cover him ad nauseum because it makes them money. Certainly. And that's what everybody else does. Well, I mean, they're going to make money, and we can pretty much bet on that. But at the same time, CNN is largely responsible for the elevation of him. They covered him before they thought he was serious because it was great for ratings. And eventually one day, <laughs> great for ratings became... Uh, you know, something else. So, I mean, maybe they it can continues to be good for ratings. The New York Times is, I mean, I, I saw a story not too long ago that their subscription rate has shot through the roof since he's become the president. <laughs> the failing New York Times. <laughs> right. They're not failing no more. This is a great. But you know what? And one last story from the book, and then I'll stop because i got to say something for this special. But um, apparently he's, Donald Trump is obsessed with the New York Times. That's why he's always talking about them. And always talking to them Always as well. talking to them, which is the key. He brings in the New York Times, every week for a set-down exclusive interview. He does. He's dying to win their approval, according to this book. And again, then you look at reality. He does bring them in every week. He is always talking about them. Yeah. Why would he ever let him back in the White House if he hated them this bad? Right. Do, you, you don't have to give exclusive interviews to people. You just say, I don't want to. Well, Stan, you know what it is. Is is He grew, he grew up in New York. He mm -hmm. became very wealthy in New York. He made a lot of deals in the 80s. And the New York Times was like the pinnacle media organization in New York. That's it. It, it was, it, so he's pr spent his whole career, um, you know, if you, if, if you can get into the Times, you're a made man in New York. Certainly. And so, um, and that adulation, you know, that, um, I don't even know if the word is, um, not just adulation, but just that. Um, Gosh, that uh, admiration. Yeah, of, just of the, that the validation. Is there what, you go. That's the word I'm looking for. The validation through the New York Times, if they could ever come out and write a, you know, an editorial that says, hey, he's doing a good job as president. That's all he wants. That's what, that would be, you know. He might and, stop giving him interviews at that point. No. No, probably not. It's, he, he, listen, uh, bu business guys like him, yeah. they're always on to the next deal. They get this deal done, they go to the next one. Yeah. So it, it would be, oh, they're happy with me this week, now i got to make them happy next week. So, indeed, indeed. But I, which is funny because he doesn't seem to want to do anything to make them happy. But, um, but I, you know, I, a lot of people don't like Donald Trump being our president for many reasons. I think as a journalist it makes it interesting. It's a very interesting time. That's just from a perspective of being interested in politics and history. I love keeping up with things during this time. This book is one of the greatest political books I've ever read. Uh, I've read, I've got stacks of them at home, and I just, I'm completely in, engrossed in this. I do recommend reading it um, for the sake of knowing what's going on in your country, at least allegedly knowing what's going on in your country. Right, right. But, you know, I'll include that in there. Um, if the book were to be 100% accurate, and I would highly suspect nobody on this planet could pull that feed off, right. um, then yes, it would be, uh, it would be very shocking, and per I I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, we would be in a situation, we should put it, that the, 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 yes. the stakes would be raised. That this, this It's, it's kind of like the old adage, like if you look at the totality of the book, there's many incendiary claims made in the book, right? Certainly. It's kind of like the old adage, you know, like you know, people claim to have been abducted by aliens. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that the mass majority of them are just lying, they're just making a story up. But it only has to be true once for there to be aliens. That's right. That's it only right. It has to be true one time. And so if just a little bit of this book is true, right. it's enormous. That's it's enormous. Yes. And, and if you go to my Twitter account, twitter.com slash Stan Morris, I have tweeted every, ch every time I'm going through a chapter and reading certain like crazy details, I'm tweeting, and I think I'm up to like 70 tweets now or something. It's crazy. <laughs> but, um, but we'll be doing a special on that later this week because I do think it's worthy uh, for everybody to know about. George Jarrett, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today here on NEA Report. We're glad to have you in. As always, please like and share the page if you like what we're doing here. And like and share the video as well. It would uh, mean a whole lot to us, okay? Let's give you one final look at that forecast before we get out of here today. It does look like we've got a wacky and wild day on the way in the forecast. In fact, let's take a look at it right now. First of all, I want to tell you about tonight, down to 43 degrees with some rainfall out there. Now, Wednesday, it's going to be even crazier with the high near 59. And then on Thursday, 63 degrees. The chance for rain increases. It really is at the most on a Thursday.
But then late Thursday night, and especially early Friday morning after 3 a.m., the possibility for snowfall moves into northeast Arkansas. And you'll take a look uh, at that ridiculously low high for Friday. We're going from 63 Thursday to 34 on Friday, and there's a chance for the possibility of up to, uh, we saw maybe half an inch of accumulation of snowfall. I mean, it's very unlikely that we're going to see that. But you may have some schools that begin Friday morning, and they're saying, hey, you know, we have to do the delay thing. I mean, I'm just going to get people's hopes up right now, best you can do. Um, so we'll be watching that very closely. There is that possibility for some rain and snow mix that's coming in early, early Friday, late Thursday, early Friday. Then this weekend, we're looking at lows back in the teens, uh, but the precipitation all gone by Saturday. That's all we got today. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on NEA Report. We'll see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock for more news from Northeast Arkansas.